I think. And that's on. And then we'll turn this on. So it's been a good day. We got our 500 items for Thrivent. So uh, I guess we owe a special thank you to Thrivent, and we'll give them an extra special thank you when the check comes. But um, it's very nice that they do this, and they usually do it twice a year. And I'm not, do you know how many times we've participated in this? I think four I or five. I know one other. Oh, I know it's more than one. Probably. Well, I know three since we've come back to church. Yeah, and I, we did it once or twice before years. that too, yeah. So they've probably given us a couple thousand dollars. Yeah, so that's a very special thing. Um, as far as announcements go, we had our extra new one that we are going to have um, missionary Rebecca Krupp with us on October 29th. That's cool. Yeah, so we're going to do that during the evening service, this service, so that the kids can meet a missionary. So I wanted to, uh, I talked to Joe and everybody, I thought that would be kind of cool that the kids got to meet a missionary. Yeah. What's up, Worky? Y'all yeah. set for winter? Um, uh, I can run through all of the other announcements if you want. If not, we'll just uh, call it there. Um, don't forget, Revival is the 26th to the 28th. So that's going to be special. And uh, I think that's all we got. Let me grab my pen and we can start doing prayer requests. All right. So first prayer request, just for everybody to pray. Um, you guys probably noticed Daryl and Charlene aren't with us today. Um, their daughter, Rachel, got married this weekend. So we want to say congratulations to Rachel and Joseph. And um, they are staying there with the girls. Where do they do that? I don't know, but it's not in Pennzoil. Around, <laughs> around Blackwood. Blackwood? Charlie okay. Blackwood. Blackwood. Oh, Blackwood. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, Daryl and Charlene are staying at their house with the girls. Uh, you remember baby Joey that we prayed for? Well, she's not a baby anymore, but Joey and her sister Bella. So congratulations to Rachel and Joseph. And congratulations to... Daryl and Charlene. Now they've got Annalise's wedding coming up. April. April. So, yeah. Just looking me for her. Well, I, I figured you'd know. Yeah, walking calendar. Jill's not here. I need, to, I need somebody to turn to. <laughs> um, so pray for um, Daryl and Charlene as they uh, finish out their weekend with the grandkids. Hopefully they are, uh, hopefully they get some rest tonight. <laughs> but it's a good thing to celebrate a wedding. Um, we want to keep Daryl in our prayers. He's in the middle of a medicine change right now. Um, so this should be a good thing, but, but it's one of those things where they have to take him off the old medicine before they start the new medicine. And that can, you know, yeah. it's the one that he takes for the pain in his legs and feet, the nerve pain. So he's in a little bit of pain right now. Well, I think it's just that it wasn't working great, but it was doing something. And right. so to not have that, all those nerves are firing. Yeah. It's kind of like neuropathy when you have diabetes. Right. Yeah. So the nerves are saying or there's something wrong. Restless yeah. leg syndrome. And so yeah. Down. The nerves are saying there's something wrong, even though there isn't. Yeah. Nerve pain is the worst. It is. Oh, my mom's on. Hi, mom. Uh, okay, so that was a couple prayer requests for me. Who else has a prayer request? I have a friend, her son, her grandson is finally there, Issa, to come to America. This would last a couple weeks, you know, I want to come. Your friend's grandson is trying to get a visa to come to America. Yeah, just for a visit with his wife. He's trying to America. Thank you. Janice is asking her operation to be Okay. And one of the nurse practitioners at Alfred Eye, uh, her name is Tina, is uh, going through cancer treatment. So I'm praying for her. Tina and cancer treatment, right? Mm hmm. 
Okay. And since we just played for Tom, I guess I'll just say that. Yep, Tom Bell. Mm -hmm. He's got a long road of recovery here, so. Yeah. Just remember that he's got a wife and young kids. So keep his wife Courtney in your prayers too. She's trying to be there for her husband and also take care of the kids. And that's a lot of stress. So. Yeah. Thankfully, they have some family there to help them. That's what he's super young too. Yeah. He is quite young, yeah. Yeah, yeah he's only in his 40s. Yeah. Yeah, he's pretty I think he's in his early 80s. 40s. Huh? I think he's early 40s. He's, he's young. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, so the good news is he's off of ECMO, but he's still got a long road. So thank you for those prayer requests. Um, Diane asked that we would continue praying for Ruth Ann. She said Ruth Ann is doing better this week, um, but uh, she's not back to normal just yet. So also please pray for George because he's always worried about his mom. Pray for John. John. He's the one who had the liver transplant, right? Yeah, they had to do that a couple months ago, right? To get ready for this. Yeah. I remember Barbara talking about that. Um, please keep Eric in your prayers. Um, he's had kind of a rough week, spent some time in the hospital. Um, so he could definitely use some prayers. Um, one specific thing he's dealing with now is he's holding on to a lot of extra fluid and they're trying to get that squared away so please pray for eric um, please pray for marty he did come back home um, so he had to go back into the rehab for a little while after he hit his head when he fell um, but he is back home here in Pennville. so i hope to get to see him this week and if any of you want to stop and see him probably know where he is. All right, my mom is asking prayer for a friend of ours. Her name is Tanya Farinaccio. Uh, she had a brain tumor removed this week. Thanks for sharing that, Mom. All right. Who else has prayer requests? Can you pray in our prayers? Faye, yes. Did I hear one over here, too? My niece is on the phone. Hello. Sorry, we're late. That's all right. We're doing prayer requests. Oh, that's good. Happy anniversary. Thanks. So and much. that's a praise. Today is the Onesimus anniversary. So happy anniversary okay. again. We went to my favorite restaurant, Adelphia's in Bedford. Oh yeah? Yes. Wonderful. I got the special. What I wanted was on special, so it worked out well. Wonderful. <laughs> See, cheap date. That's cheap a date. great way to celebrate that <laughs> anniversary. <laughs> 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 Nothing like a coupon to say I love you. <laughs> uh, well, I'm happy for you guys. It's great to celebrate. Good to celebrate. All right, um, I'm just looking through my list here. Um, Bethany asked us to pray for a patient that came through this week. Somebody came in and was dealing with a, a hard situation at home, and they are trying to figure out what they should do to try to help this person. So that's all the information I have. But She can call APS, which they, is the adult friend. Right, yes. Um, it was pushed up to her supervisor, but she's just praying for this, asked us to pray for this person. Right. Yeah. There's a gentleman that we uh, came to the church and we gave him food. And he okay. Food. It's just him and his four kids and he told us he's getting evicted to the end of this month. So he needs okay. care. His name is James. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, 
Uh, Richie Trout asked us to pray for him. Um, you guys might know he's been dealing with some jaw pain from an infection. Um, and part of the problem was that he did not have the insurance coverage that he thought he had. But his job has open enrollment next month. So he can upgrade his insurance and hopefully get to a specialist next month. So he's praying just to help him get through that. I don't know who had their hand up first. Pastor Dan. Uh, I told Rich that um, you call him Rick or Rich? Rich. Rich. I told Rich he really needs a periodontist, not a dentist. So right. he's going to, and I told him he could, they charge all different rates. Yes. So I told him to call them all and get uh, some information. Right. And that was the catch. He thought he had coverage that would cover that, and they don't. No. Um, so hopefully that can all get straightened out. He also has applied for a supervisor position at work. He works at the VA up in Philly. So please pray for him as he goes through those interviews. Um, I pray that it works out well. I think he'll be a good supervisor. He's got a good heart. Um, Venus asked us to please keep praying for Gloria Hess. She said she's doing well with the, with the vest, with the external pacemaker. <coughs> But please pray that they'll get good information off that and be able to figure out what's going on. Um, <laughs> Venus had a big praise. It's going to sound bad at first, but it gets better. Um, she dropped a frying pan on her foot and hurt her foot. So she was walking funny on the way to the bus. And because she was walking funny, the cyst that was in her knee broke. It popped. And now the pain's gone. <laughs> So, I love how the pan busted her foot, so she walked funny, so the cyst broke, and now the knee pain's gone. <laughs> Yay. So, she said she, she is walking better than she has in a very long time. Wow. Yeah. So, I said, you never quite know how God's going to answer things, but, yeah. Do you know? Make sure we got all this. Of course, we got the praise for Frank's surgery. So he had the first cataract done. And I don't, what was the kind of lens they put in? Um, your basic Medicare pays for it lens. Okay. <laughs> the one that Medicare pays for. Yeah. Right. But because seeing made, a lot better. They made the uh, torque lens in models, actually. Yeah. So, uh, Seeing a lot better. Going to have the other one done soon. So yeah. So that is a big praise too. We're happy that that went so well. And um, Maria asked us to keep praying for her. She's praying that uh, something would work out so that she'd have Sundays off consistently and be able to come to church. So I don't know how exactly God might answer that, whether it's through a schedule change or a job change or whatever. <laughs> but she's praying that she would have some results. And never let anybody know what you know because they'll kill your work and get Well, that's true. She has made herself uh, indispensable, yeah. So they want her there on Sundays to tell her, yeah. Yep. Now, of course, we need to keep praying for the situation in Israel. I know it's changing fast, but it looks like Lebanon has gotten involved. Hezbollah has now been launching rockets as well. So they're getting hit from more than one front right now. And there's all kinds of rumors circulating about what the U.S. is going to do or not do. I have no idea there. Check Psalm 82. Yeah, yeah. So we need to pray. I want to see what God's going to do. Well, we'll, we'll find out. We'll find out. Um, but I do know that because of the kind of fighting that's happening right now, there are a lot of civilians who are involved. A lot of families and a lot of children. And that's very heartbreaking. A lot of terrorists. Yeah. Is that because they want power? Yeah. Yeah. Well, <sighs> it, it would take us a, about three or four years to get through all the details here, but... The short answer is, this is the same land that has been disputed for thousands of years, okay? Um, the 
Gaza Strip, where Gaza City is located. That's where the Philistines were, the same area the people of Sri. Um, Darlene has some maps with her tonight, if you want to check that out. She has a cool little atlas book with her. With her. But um, these, these are the same areas that have been in dispute since the Jews left Egypt and came into the Promised Land. So for thousands of years, people have been fighting over this land. Um, Doesn't that still... like go back to Isaac and Ishmael? Well, yeah. So I think if you want to trace it all the way back, we can trace the family tree all the way back to Abraham yeah. and Isaac and Ishmael, yeah. the two sons. But in um, the immediate. But in the immediate, there were some other political issues. Um, the primary thing is the Palestinian political battles just basically says, this should not exist in any form. So this group, Hamas, that is their very vocal statement that Israel as a nation should not exist. They want it to go back to pre-1948. Um, so when you... are deported by someone who, is, who, who also desires to have it. Right. And so um, you've got other nation states like Lebanon and Iran involved in, in instead of them directly invading they're giving money to other people and giving these thousands of rockets that were launched had to come from somewhere and somebody had to pay for them and you can be pretty sure the Palestinians didn't have the money to buy them themselves and there was a pretty there had to have been a pretty sophisticated system to smuggle those rockets in without Israel catching them so it really does kind of take a, a nation to do that so you might call this a proxy war, but um, Israel is surrounded by enemies right now. As they have been for many, many years. Right. Right. Um, but because of the way that Hamas is fighting, because it's launching weapons from civilian areas, when Israel responds, they're it's civilian areas. And so the attacks that took place on the Israel side of the border where were in settlements were where, where people lived. And now the fighting that's going on both sides of the border is also where people live. It's in cities and neighborhoods. And so you have adults who are choosing to fight these kinds of fights and then children who are caught in the crossfire. Yeah. Oh, Eric is online with us. Hello, Eric. Glad you could join us online, brother. That makes me happy. So yeah, you can take it all the way back to Genesis if you want. Um, but this has been a disputed area of the world for thousands of years. Um, that area is holy to um, the three major religions that we're talking about here, Christianity, Islam, and Judaism. Um, the Temple Mount, you know, the, the actual spot where the temple's built, that area has been fought over since, well, forever. <laughs> so. These fights have been going on for longer than any of us have been alive. Um, and if I understand scripture correctly, these fights are going to continue until Jesus returns. Right. That there isn't, we're not going to have peace here until Jesus comes back. Mm -hmm. But we pray for peace. So that's what I was talking about this morning when we were talking about the, the groanings as in childbirth. We're waiting for the return of Christ because this world is broken and people are suffering because of it. And we long for that to stop. But we also know that that's only going to happen when Jesus returns. So. I, I mentioned Psalm 83 because it is, uh, I, it, we don't know when it is going to occur. But it is, these particular groups that uh, are found in Psalm 83. South of Israel, and, yeah. And Gaza, it is it is Persia, it is Iraq, it is Assyria, but mm -hmm. they're not. It's not there yet. But uh, 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 
we should be we should be looking to the skies uh, as well. Uh, it's it's also sad, but it is something all pointing to things that are end uh, end times. Mm -hmm. Yeah, something Venus brought up in Sunday school today was we, we recently finished studying uh, the book of Daniel on Wednesday nights. And there's a section in the second half of the book that talks about uh, the spirit prince of Persia and this idea of evil spiritual entities that affect the actions of empires. And in that case, we had the Archangel Michael, who was assigned to protect the remnant including Daniel and his friends, but we had another spiritual influence who was working within the empire to try to kill them, to try to destroy them. And so that's something that still goes on. So I think that's some of what Pastor John's talking about here. And Daniel had one glimpse into it in that moment as he has conversations with Gabriel. He hears some specific details about these spiritual battles going on that we can't necessarily see, but we see the results of that. And influencing empires to do the will of those opposed to God is, is part of how this works. So the same way the Holy Spirit influences us to love and do good, and evil that influences people to do evil. All right, anything else before we go to prayer? All right, let's pray. Father God, thank you for this day. Thank you that we can turn to your book for wisdom in times like this. Uh, Father, we, we lift up the nation of Israel. We lift up the innocent children on all sides. Uh, Father, we pray for peace. That's what we long for. We long for the fighting to end and for there to be no more death, to be no more war. Father, we know that that is your ultimate goal as well, and we are trying our best to wait patiently and peacefully for you to bring that day about. But we weep for those who have lost. We weep for those families who've lost loved ones today and yesterday. Uh, we weep with the families in Ukraine who lost children this week when the apartment complex was blown up. Father, we have sorrow for all this loss, and in the midst of it, we're thankful that we can look to you for hope and protection and guidance. So, Father, as these events happen, I pray that you would give us wisdom, that you would help us not to be too wrapped up and distracted in the goings of the world, but that you would also help us to be wise and shrewd and good stewards. Um, help us to stay true to your word and to stay true to your son, to not be distracted by the enemy, to not fall into the hands of false teachers, but to stay true to you. Please help us, Father. We, we know that we cannot do it without your help. As we gather tonight, Father, we lift up many to you. We lift up our brother Rich. We pray for his health situation and for um, his job application. We pray, Father, that if it's your will, that this supervisor job would go through and that you would be with him through this process. <clears throat> Father, we celebrate with Rachel and Joseph at their wedding. Father, thank you for bringing them together and thank you for the way you have changed their lives. We pray for their family. We pray for Rachel and Joseph and Bella and Joey. We also lift up Charlene and Daryl as they are caring for their grandchildren today. Um, thank you that they have the privilege and honor of taking care of grandbabies. And um, we pray for Daryl right now. We pray, Father, that you would be with him through this medical change, through this change in his prescription. We also pray that you'd continue to be with his brother, Rich, as he's healing from his um, hip infection. Father, we lift up Ruthann and George to you. We thank you that Ruthann is improving and we pray that you would give George peace as he worries about his mom. We lift up Gloria Hess to you, Father. We thank you that she's had a good week, and we pray that she would stay well and be able to stay at home. We lift up our brother Eric, Father. We're thankful that he can join us online, and we pray that you would continue to be with him this week, help him to regain his strength, 
and get some good restorative sleep. And uh, that we see him back here very soon. We lift up our brother Marty. Father, we thank you that he's healing from his fall. And um, we pray for his situation as well, physically, spiritually, and for his family. We lift up our sister Faye to you, Father. We pray for the staff over at Southgate that they would have kind hearts and wise minds as they care for her. We lift up Venus to you, Father. Thank you for this funny adventure with the frying pan and the foot and the knee and that it all worked out to having her walking pain free. Um, it just makes a smile, Father, and thank you. Thank you for being with her this week. Uh, we lift up Bethany and her co-workers and this patient that they're trying to help. Father, we know that a lot of this is out of Bethany's hands to, to do anything, you know, hands-on with, but Father, we very much lift this person up in prayer. We pray for their safety and their provision. Father, we celebrate with Pastor Karen and Frank for 46 years of marriage. Thank you, Father, for all of these wonderful years together. We pray for many more. We also celebrate with Frank at his successful surgery on his eye. Thank you for that blessing, Father. And um, thank you. Good things to celebrate, Father. Uh, we lift up our sister Maria. We pray, Father, that you would work in her life to help her to have a way to be at church every Sunday. Um, we pray, Father, that you would give her that desire and that you would make that way. We lift up Kay's friend's grandson as he is working to get a visa to come to the U.S. <coughs> Father, please help that work out. We also lift up John to you, who had the liver transplant and triple bypass. Um, we pray, Father, for continued healing for him. Um, we lift up Janice as she's preparing for surgery on her lung on Tuesday. We pray for Jim and Carol, Father, that you would give them peace, that you would give Janice peace, and that this would bring full healing to her lung. Yes. Let's kind of put this chapter to a close. Father, we lift up um, Tina. Uh, at AI, we pray, Father, for her cancer treatments, that they would be successful and that you would be with her through this journey. Father, when we pray for journeys, we pray for the Bells, we pray for Tom and Courtney and their family. Father, we thank you for the continued progress that Tom has had and we pray for, we pray for more. We pray for full healing and we lift up Courtney as she is trying to be a wife and a mother in difficult circumstances. Please help her, Father. We lift up Tanya, Father. We thank you that um, she was able to have this surgery to remove the brain tumor, and we pray for healing for her. We lift up Darlene's unspoken prayer requests, and we also want to give you thanks for uh, these donations that came in this week for the pantry that have allowed us to qualify for this um, special donation. Father, thank you for making these ways. Thank you for providing. And thank you for the moments when we get to be a part of it. We lift up uh, this gentleman, James, who came to the church for help. We pray for James and his four children and his housing situation. Um, if it's possible, Father, help us have more contact with him so we might help him and, and be friends to him. We lift up Gina, Father, for her unspoken prayer requests. We thank you for the progress that has happened and we pray for more progress to come. I want to close again, Father, by praying for Israel. I pray for the different people involved in this, different government leaders. Um, Father, we pray for your will above all else, mm -hmm. but we also pray honestly, and we desire peace. We desire no more children to suffer. Mm -hmm. And so, Father, we lift that up to you, the desire of our hearts. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 <clears throat> I wanted to pray for uh, Eileen's family, but I don't right, know. Right, right. But I don't know the family. We know that Eileen. Um, I don't think we've announced that in a prayer meeting yet. Eileen, who we had lifted up, um, she did pass away. So it counts. Those names would count.
She is a friend that we came across in our ministries and she had been taken into hospice care and passed away very quickly after that. So I'm very grateful that she's not in pain, although we mourn her loss. It's hard. It's hard. Well, I think tonight is a, is a fitting topic. We are talking about the Passion Week. We are in John chapter 18, and the reason I bring that up is this is a time of grief mixed with hope and joy. We're going through some of the harder sections of the gospel in these next couple of chapters, because we are talking about the trial and the suffering and the execution of Jesus. Tonight, we're going to be talking about Peter's denial of Jesus, and these are difficult topics emotionally. But of course, they're very important for us to discuss and read about. So we uh, finished off in John chapter 18, verse 14 last week. So we're going to be picking up at verse 15 tonight, which is Peter's first denial. And uh, yes, we are going to go back and read when Jesus predicts that. So we can uh, kind of keep that, keep a pin in that. We'll get there in a minute. So John chapter 18, if we could have a volunteer, please, to read verses 15 through 18. Thank you, Carol. Simon Peter followed Jesus, as did another of his disciples. That other disciple was acquainted with the high priest, so he was allowed to enter the high priest's courtyard with Jesus. Peter had to stay outside the gate. Then the disciple, who knew the high priest, spoke to the woman watching at the gate, and she let Peter in. The woman asked Peter, you're not one of that man's disciples, are you? He said, no, he said, I'm not. Because it was cold, the, out, the household servants and guards had made a charcoal fire. They stood around it, warming themselves, and Peter stood with them, warming himself. Thank you, Carol. So just so we remember where we're all at, at this point in the story, Jesus has been arrested. Last week we talked about the scene in the garden and Peter chopping off the servant's ear. And so tonight, where we pick up, Jesus is in custody. And at least two of the disciples have followed closely to see what happens. Okay, We jump right in here with a little bit of a question. Who is there trying to follow Jesus? Peter. Peter? And someone else. I don't know who the other one is. You don't know who the other, does anybody know who the other one is? No. no. The short answer is, it doesn't say. It's a friend of the high priest. Yeah. So we've, we've got some clues. We don't really have enough to be definitive. So I did do some research here, and I looked through a bunch of commentaries. And uh, there are some people who agree and some people who disagree, which is generally what you find when you look at enough commentaries. Right. If you read 11 commentaries, you'll get 14 opinions. <laughs> and that happens sometimes. Um, there are a lot of people in history who have believed that this is John How because we know that? It's he, at the cross, right. Mary. he is the only one who stayed all the way through the cross so it makes sense that he did not flee um, he never names himself which is maybe one check for why this could be him um, he usually refers to himself as the disciple who Jesus loves which he doesn't do here. So that's a strike that it might not be him. There's another complication here in that this other disciple is acquainted with the high priest and was known well enough with the household staff that he was allowed to enter the courtyard. Now, if we remember John and when we met him, does anybody know maybe what kind of economic class he came from or what kind of job he had? He was a fisherman. Yeah. And do you know where he lived? Up in Galilee. Okay. So Peter and Andrew and James and John all got called right together. And they were fishermen. Yeah. Not a whole lot of fishing in Jerusalem. Sons of Zebedee. Yeah. 
So some people think that that would preclude this from being John. And maybe that could point to someone like maybe Matthew, who was a tax collector and might have run in some of these bigger circles. But would the high priest have had anything to do with the tax collector? Probably not. So we could basically spend all night here kind of guessing back and forth. Where I try to land in some of these is, to be honest, I pray to God about these kinds of interpretations, and I say, God, I really want to know who this is, right? Because I'm honest. I, I want to know. I would like a name, right? I'm honest with God. And then God reminds me, well, Paul, I didn't write a name there, and I didn't tell John to write a name there, so you're going to have to be happy not having a name. And I say, okay, but when I get to heaven, I'm going to ask you. <laughs> I'm probably going to be too distracted with Jesus. I'm sure when I get there, my list of questions is going to go right out the window. Um, but again, there are plenty of times in Scripture where we have unanswered questions. We, we would like more detail. It goes back to maybe our article of faith on Scripture is a good tool for this. Why do we have the Bible? What is, it, what is its goal, right? So if God put every piece of history and every name and everything every person did in this book, it'd be so big you could never learn it. John said it would go around the world. Like the book, all the books of the world wouldn't be enough to hold it. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Something yep. like that. Yeah. And we'll get there at the end of the book here. You'll we'll hear that. But um, So there are times that God chooses through his influence, through the influence of the Holy Spirit, to include some details and not include other details. So we just have to be content to say, I would like to know, but it doesn't say. We do know that Peter's there, and I think that's why that detail is there. Sometimes you're given one detail, and God leaves out some other details to help us focus on the main point, right? Um, if every time we saw Jesus, it told us what kind of leather his sandals were made out of, we would spend all this time thinking about leather and sandals. And we would pay less time to, to his words. Right? So clearly what's going on with Peter is the point. So Peter has followed Jesus along with another disciple. Somehow, because this other disciple was known to the household, they're allowed to come into the courtyard. Okay. Um, what are they doing at, in the courtyard? Warming themselves. Warming themselves, Warming themselves right? So this is a pretty common thing, right? You've got household staff that work in the courtyard or outside. You've got guards, you've got servants. So there's a fire to keep them warm. And they let their friends come over and warm up. It says, but Peter was standing outside at the gates. At first. Oh, okay. So when they arrive, Peter had to wait outside. Oh, the right. disciple so comes in. in. And, let him in. I see. and yes, and then the woman at the gate lets Peter in. So this is another one of those, maybe the woman at the gate was from Galilee, and she knew Peter, and knew John, and knew some of the disciples. We don't know. But whatever happens, the first disciple can just walk right in, and then whether it's Peter making the way, or, or the other disciple making the way, or whatever, Peter is now invited in, standing by the fire. The new guy walks up. It makes sense that there'd be some conversation, right? This woman, the woman who was watching the gate and let Peter in, what does she ask him? If he's one of the, this man's disciples. Yeah. And which man are we talking about? Peter. Jesus. Yeah. Oh. Is Peter one of Jesus' disciples? Is he? Yes. Yeah. yeah. But he denies it. But he denies it. No, I am not. Mm -hmm. So... What do you think is going on here? Why? What reason would Peter have for denying knowing Jesus? Fear of the officials. Okay. Fear and the officials. Yeah. Kind of the same thing. Yeah. Um, what happened to John the Baptist when he got arrested? Hmm. He was put in prison for yeah. a long time. And, and then they cut his head off. Yeah. And so far, things have not gone smoothly for Jesus. Jesus warned the disciples that he was going to be arrested and tried and beaten and executed. So we understand why Peter might have some fears. Yeah. 
We have to be careful here, here not to look too, we don't want to look down our noses at Peter, okay? Because this is a very traumatic experience for him. It can be easy for us to point a finger. You know what, I think, I mean, Jesus told him this would happen. You will deny me three times before the cock crows. Which goes to Douglas. You wouldn't think that, I mean, okay, the first time, and then he would say, wait a minute, <laughs> and stop himself for the next two times. Yeah. Well, I think uh, maybe I can relate a little bit. I know there are times that I've gotten myself into a mess and then later on thought, you know what, this is why God said not to do that thing. Right. Sure. You know, I think this is one of those times where Peter's circumstance looms so large emotionally that it has pushed out a lot of his thoughts. Um, if you remember, it doesn't say it in the Gospel of John, but, but when Jesus is praying in the garden and Peter and some of the, two of the others fall asleep, mm -hmm. do you remember what Jesus says to them? Could you not stay with me at least an hour? He does. Yeah. And then he says, pray that you might not fall. I think Jesus knew what was coming and knew that Peter was only going to make it through if he was prayed up. But Peter was distracted. In the garden, even though Jesus clearly was not trying to pick a fight and he was in charge, Peter whips out the sword and tries to kill somebody. Um, so Peter is, is running on adrenaline and emotion and reaction now. Yeah, yeah. Quick to... So we can see maybe in times of stress some of his old nature pops out. We also have to remember this is before Pentecost. Okay, So this is before Peter has experienced that fullness of the presence of the Holy Spirit in his heart. Okay? So we got to cut him a little slack. But it's a teaching moment for all of us. We shouldn't cut ourselves slack. No, not us. Him. <laughs> yeah, we need to cut him some slack. Okay. So... We're going to jump back and forth now here, okay? We're going to go from Peter to Jesus to Peter to Jesus, okay? So picking up, um, let's see, I do this all the time. Just so we're all on the same page, let's go back and read what Jesus said. Can someone read John chapter 13, verse 38, just a few chapters ago? Jesus answered, will you lay down your life for me? Very truly, I tell you, before the cock crows, you will have denied me three times. Yeah. So this is right after the foot washing. Mm -hmm. So this is not long in time, but a lot has happened between that conversation and Peter's denial. Peter has said he's willing to die for Jesus. And honestly, when he pulls out that sword and swings at the servant, that could have cost his life. There were Roman guards there. There were temple guards there. Mm -hmm. Just pulling out that sword could have been enough for them to kill Peter. Right. So we see this kind of tortured heart. Yeah. So Jesus clearly said, before the rooster crows tomorrow morning, you will deny three times that you even know me. And here we've had time warp. But you know, you can buy a, a thing that you can put on a rooster to keep him from crowing. Yeah, it's called a hatchet. Oh. <laughs> and a broiler pan. That's a new kind of hat. I think my son had a rooster. Yeah, and decided to put this thing on him. <laughs> yeah. I guess this rooster was pretty strong. Yeah. yeah. I like my way, but sure, we'll try. Everybody's got chicken in the rooster. Let's pick up now. We're going back to where Jesus is being questioned by the Jewish authorities. Now, he has not yet been in Roman custody. He's in the custody of the, um, the, the priests and the Sanhedrin and the temple guards and the, that crew. Okay? Can someone please read verses 19 through 24? There are a couple names here. 
Um, probably only Pastor Tom and Pastor Karen know how to say it, so don't worry. Just do your best. Inside the high priest began asking Jesus about his followers, and when he had been teaching them, Jesus replied, Everyone knows what I teach. I have preached regularly in synagogues, mm -hmm. in the temple, where the where the people gathered. I have not spoken in secret. Why are you asking? So, let's get into this. We've cut from Peter out into the courtyard to inside, and we're getting a view at what's happening here. Um, who is there questioning Jesus? The high priest. The high priest. Okay. Um, who or what is a high priest? Any ideas? Okay. He's the only one allowed inside the temple he's got area it. himself. Yeah, on the Day of Atonement, he's the one who's allowed to go into the Holy of Holies. Yeah. So this is the man this is the top of the food chain here as far as priests go. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, he might live. What was that? Is he a Levite? Yes, he right. had to be a Levite, and at this time in history, he also had to be a descendant of Zadok. So it had been narrowed down a couple times. So a Levite, a descendant of Aaron, and then later on a descendant of Zadok. So, yeah, there, there, this was not a job that just anybody could do. Your family line dictated if you were eligible. But then, and I don't completely understand this, but there was a process for selecting a high priest that involved the Sanhedrin. Um, so this is somebody who... Well, if you were a Jewish person and you ran into the high priest when you were in Jerusalem for the Passover, how do you think most people would treat the high priest? With all respect. Yeah, and maybe a little bit of fear too, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I bow down. Yeah. And let's say you've never met the high priest and you don't know anything about Jerusalem politics. How would you expect a high priest to behave towards people? Like Jesus. Almighty himself. Yeah. I mean, probably an intimidating figure, right? But you would expect justice from a high priest, right? And you would certainly expect the high priest to follow the law, right? Yeah. Supposed to. Supposed to. So let's let's keep that idea at the front of our minds. So Jesus is brought in, and the high priest asks Jesus about his followers and what he's been teaching. What have you been teaching? Now, we have to be careful here that we don't treat this just as a conversation. Okay? What's happening now also has some, some legal overtones. So this is a little bit more like a cross-examination in a trial than it is two people sitting down talking. And not only is it a, a legal conversation we're dealing with some specific rules that are triggered in Jewish law. If a man is to be accused of something that will be, the, the punishment will be death, they're required to have at least two witnesses against what the person did to prove that the person did whatever requires the death penalty. Okay? It can't, it can't even be just one witness. It has to be at least two. Understand? So this man, this high priest, says to Jesus, what have you been teaching? How does Jesus answer in verse 20? Yeah. 
you know. He, everybody here knows. He says, I've done nothing in secret. Everything I've done is known. So there's two letters. I know as an American, we think of like Rambo gets captured and he's mouthing off to the guard, right? There's a, maybe a tendency in our culture to treat this comment as sarcastic. But I, I, I don't think Jesus is being flippant here. Okay? He has been brought before them. He knows they want to kill him, right? But the requirement of the law, there, there are a couple of requirements. They have to have an accusation, an accusation against him, wherein the punishment would be death. Okay, and they have to have witnesses to prove that he did it. Well, they haven't come out and said that yet. Okay. Right. So th that's where they're fishing here. They're fishing. Everyone knows what I teach. I've I've not spoken in secret. If Jesus really were a criminal, would he be running around the temple and the synagogues telling everybody what he did? No. You know why they never found D.B. Cooper? They never told anybody anything, right? Um, if you run your mouth, you get caught. But Jesus has nothing to hide because he's done nothing wrong. There's, there's been no deceit, no deception, no lies. And he's spoken clearly. Many people in that room have heard him teach, and they could get up and speak. But if they honestly got up and said what he did, it would kind of be for him, not against him. Mm -hmm. And then they would be in trouble too. Yeah. Why are you asking me this question? Ask those who heard me. Bring witnesses. If this is a trial, bring your witnesses. Okay? How does the temple guard react? Slaps him. What? Slaps the Messiah in the face. Mm -hmm for telling the high priest to follow the rules. A little bit of irony there, I guess. Yeah. But honestly, it's just heartbreaking. Can't stand it. Yeah. They're going to spit on you and slap him. Yeah. Yeah. Too much. Too much. It is. And so, how does Jesus reply to this slap in verse 23? If I did what you said, give me a charge and bring witnesses. But here's the thing. When Jesus describes how he speaks, he says, I did not speak in secret. Where are they now and what's going on? They arrested him at night, drug him off to the house at night, and they're doing a secret trial at night in the high priest's home. They didn't bring him to the temple court. They didn't... They're doing all these things in secret, breaking the laws, while accusing him of breaking the law when he did everything in public and didn't break the law. He was going to get put back, the time back on the Sunday, didn't he? He did. He did. It's also supposed to be the whole Sanhedrin. Only certain ones were invited to this meeting. Yeah. So it's what we might call a kangaroo court. Mm -hmm. Jesus knows it. They know it. <laughs> And he's calling them out on it. You're supposed to be the high priest. You're supposed to know the law. And you're supposed to enforce the law. And here you are twisting the law and twisting your power. And this is going to come out too in a minute when Jesus talks to Pilate. Deep down they know he's innocent. But they also recognize that he's dangerous for their status quo. Yeah. Okay. So Jesus is appealing to the law. If I have said anything wrong, you must prove it. You need to call witnesses, and you need to prove it. But if I'm speaking the truth, there's no reason to beat him. No, but I think he got smacked because he didn't answer them the way that they wanted him to answer. Yeah, they wanted him to just give in to their power. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But we've seen that Jesus doesn't really behave that way. When the temple guards and the Roman soldiers came in the garden, and Jesus stood up and spoke, do you remember what they did? They bowed down. They bowed down. They bowed down. Yeah. 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 So we see <coughs> these, these power dynamics being flipped on their head. 
over and over and over again. <coughs> so that's where it's cut off there. They tie him up again and they, they send him off. Okay? Um, they thought this was going to be a quick and easy, he's going to be afraid and he's going to talk and try to cry and beg and all these things. <coughs> He doesn't do, he doesn't behave the way they would. So they don't expect it. All right, so the first questioning has not gone the way they want. Jesus has been struck, but he's still alive. Now we're going to go back out to the courtyard where Peter is. Um, I'm sure they didn't skip anything here. Okay. Uh, they send him away back to the courtyard, verses 25 to 27. And remember, this is Peter and the other servants and guards standing around the fire in the courtyard. Could somebody read 25 to 27? Okay. Now Simon Peter was standing and warming himself. They asked him, you are not also one of his disciples, are you? He denied it and said, I am not. One of the slaves of the high priest, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, asked, Did I not see you in the garden with him? Again, Peter denied it, and at that moment, the cock crowed. Thank you. So the first denial was the servant girl who was kind of at the gate. The second denial is someone else standing around the fire and says, Wait, you're, aren't you one of his disciples? And what does he say? No. Nope. Then the third person, we're kind of escalating here, right? We've gone from, you know, in their culture, a female accusing a male would have had the lowest kind of weight court wise. Then you have a man accusing a man. Now we have a witness, okay? Who's the third person to accuse Peter? Household slave of the high priest, a relative of the man whose ear had been cut off. We don't know a lot, but there's an important detail here that he is a household slave. We're going to directly reference this in a little bit, but um, in order to for you to remain ceremonially clean as a Jewish person, you didn't have Gentiles in your house. Okay, so the fact that this man is a household slave, it tells us he is a Jewish male. So we've gone from a female servant to an unknown male to a Jewish male. So each three times we escalate the weight of what's being asked. And now it's a person who just saw him earlier this night, saw him swing that sword. Now you can see why he might want to deny that, right? Right. Yeah, I'm the guy who tried to cut your cousin's ear off. <laughs> Actually, tried to cut your cousin's head off and got his ear instead. But it was his head. And then immediately the rooster crowed. We don't hear much from Peter in this series. Okay, In, in some of the other Gospels, we get a little bit more detail um, where they call him out for his accent and things like that. But in this telling, the way John tells it, it's pretty sparse. But I think sometimes that cuts deep. It cuts to the bone. What are you thinking about or seeing in your mind's eye or feeling as you read this? I know at the end of, well, towards the end of Luke, when that occurred, you know, Peter just broke down and wept because he knew what Jesus had said just came through. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It all came back yeah. when he hears that rooster crow. Oh, yeah. Oh, no. I did. This is what Jesus said I was going to do. Yeah. And I just did it. And I just did it. And there he is in there with who knows what happening to Jesus. And I'm out here and I won't even say that I know who he is. Yeah. So you can understand the depth of Peter's brokenness here. Yeah. Maybe you've been in this place where you've denied Christ sometime in your past. I know a lot of us have. And I'm not here trying to call you out. I'm certainly not here to judge you. But I think a lot of us understand the depth of the heartache that Peter's going to be going through here. I think that we should have compassion on Peter, but
But this is also a cautionary tale for us. That there will be times where it will be costly for us to, to rise up and be counted as a servant of Christ. It's, um, it's recorded in all four Gospels. The yeah. Denial. Yeah, this denial is recorded in all. That's a good point. Not every event is recorded in all four Gospels, but this is one of the ones that is. Yeah. The feeding of the crowd, the miraculous feeding of the crowd, is in four Gospels. Right. The 5,000? 5,000. Yeah. So we can believe that this was important to all, all four Gospel writers. Yeah. I'm intentionally going a little slow here because this is very intense. Billy Graham once said, if you were hauled into court uh, for being a Christian, would there be enough evidence against you? Yeah. And would your neighbors and co-workers and so forth have enough evidence against you? It's a good question. Yeah. Would you be convicted? I hope so. Yeah. Now, for better or for worse, we live in a, in a country and in a time where it's not illegal to be a Christian where it's relatively safe and comfortable to be a Christian. Not yet. Um, well, the days are coming where that's not going to be true. But those days are here in a lot of parts of the world. So we started our conversation tonight in prayer talking about Israel and Hamas and Hezbollah. You guys know that in, in the Middle East in particular, or in Northern Africa, there are many groups a lot of them Muslim extremist groups that will murder people upon finding out that they're Christians. Things are a little better in China now than they used to be, but it's still quite dangerous in China to be a global Christian, particularly if you're a gospel Christian and not a do what the government wants you to say Christian. Please. There's a, I don't know which Sunday it is, but there's one Sunday a year that set aside to, for us to pray for the persecuted church. And I was shocked to find out from them that in the last century, more Christians have been killed, and pers persecuted and killed, than all the other centuries of Christianity. Mm -hmm. We're relatively sheltered from that here. Mm -hmm. But all the more reason for us to rise up and be faithful. Yeah. Um, one of the things that's not expressly written here is that the reason Peter is denying Jesus is because he was one of the few that stayed close. Most of the other disciples scattered. Okay? So we got to count that for him. But yeah, this is a heartbreaking moment. Another thing to bring up, we were joking about getting a, a rooster not to crow, right? When a rooster crows, can you hear it? Oh, yeah. Everybody can hear it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I want to take a moment and ask you, what do you think that was like at that moment for Jesus, with his cheeks still burning from being slapped by the guard, to hear the rooster crow, mm -hmm. and to know what was going on outside? Hurtful. I bet that hurt a whole lot more than the slap. Especially since he was the one that told Peter, you are the rock that I will build my church upon. So let's take a moment here. We'll ease up on the intensity a little bit and speak of hope. For Peter to be called the rock upon which the church will be built, and then for Peter to deny Jesus, you'd think that would disqualify him from his job, wouldn't you? Why didn't it? Because Jesus and God know his heart. Jesus loved him. Yeah. And Jesus forgave him when he repented. Yeah, Jesus didn't hold it against him. No. That's why he asked, do you love me three times? Yeah, three and that's times. a beautiful conversation, yeah. Isn't it wonderful, Isn't that wonderful that Jesus doesn't behave like the world? <laughs> Amen. <laughs> God, there's godly, uh, there's, um, we can repent and feel sorry that we've sinned, and that's a godly feeling. But there's regret that is of the evil one, and that results in terrible things like suicide. 
since you brought it up. And the difference between Judas and Peter. Exactly. Because they both denied Jesus in each in their own way. But uh, Judas committed suicide. Right. Mm -hmm. He didn't ask for forgiveness. He only threw the money back at the priests and said, I don't want blood money. But that wasn't enough. That's not... Yeah. That's not appeasing God. He should have appeased God and sought his forgiveness. Excellent point. Excellent point. Judas tries to give the money back like, uh, yeah. I didn't eat the cookie. But you don't have the, I love you, Lord. You know I love you. You don't have that, yeah? Yes, you Okay. So now let's get into the trial with Pilate. Um, you want to bring something else up? A little trip, piece of trivia. Sure. Uh, uh, when I uh, uh, moved to Grand Rapids, I was uh, uh, the the evangelical world that I was used to growing up and throughout most of my life was uh, uh, situated around uh, Nazarenes, Christian Mission Alliance, and uh, a few Baptists along the way, and, and uh, uh, Free Methodists, etc. Pretty typical stuff, evangelicals. I moved to Grand Rapids and ran into this this grand group of Dutch Reform, and um, uh, uh, saw a bunch of churches with a site that I had not grown up with at all. That is, on their steeples, they had roosters. Oh. And, and oh, right. uh, if you go to uh, uh, many, I, I don't know if all, I wouldn't say all, but certainly in Grand Rapids, was hardly a steeple on a, on a church with, with a partially all the, uh, so many reform, different kinds of reformed churches uh, but without a rooster and uh, this is this is where it comes from wow. it's, it's not only a symbol of, uh, of Peter's sin and denial and, but uh, Jesus is grace it's a symbol of Christ and so the rooster church growing up had a rooster. Yeah. Some of you probably know my wife is Dutch and she grew up reformed and they, uh, it goes deep in their family. So, yeah. Interesting. I'll have to ask her about that. I never thought about that. So, uh, Pontius Pilate, he's kind of the Roman bigwig of the area. He's the one in charge of Jerusalem. Um, maybe some background to understand this area was known for its revolts. Rome kind of prided themselves on running a tight ship and Jerusalem was the squeaky wheel. Okay, so Pilate was sent there to deal with this. Um, yes. I have a question and we discussed that the Sanhedrin and the Pharisees, they mm -hmm. only dealt with spiritual religious matters. Mm -hmm. Okay, so he was being examined by them earlier, mm -hmm. and now you're saying he's going to Pontius Pilate, which is state matters. It is. How did they go from spiritual to state, and to who decided that he was guilty? Mm -hmm. This is going to be part of our discussion going through. Pilate's going to address this. The short answer is, even though they had full authority on religious matters, they did not have authority to execute someone. So if someone broke religious law and it required execution, they still had to go through the Romans to have that person executed. Okay. So the high priest decided that even without witnesses that Jesus was guilty and decided to send him on to Pilate? Well, in some of the gospel accounts, we're told that witnesses were bribed. Okay. It wasn't that hard to bribe witnesses. It honestly still isn't. Well, I, I, I didn't hear um, anything where it said that they had brought witnesses. In John, it doesn't refer. It doesn't mention that in John. But if you read all four gospel accounts, it's mentioned elsewhere. So this is going to come out, but we'll take a moment and talk about it ahead of time so we understand what's going on. There is a very tense kind of truce between the religious leadership and the Roman leadership at this point. Um, the Romans know that if there's going to be a revolt in Jerusalem, these are the people that are going to lead it. 
because they've got the hearts and minds of the people behind them. They've got the organization. If anybody can lead a successful revolt, it's going to be them. The Romans were strong students of history, and they know that when Antiochus IV was overthrown during the Maccabean Revolt, it was a priest that led that revolt, and it was the religious people who led it. So Rome knows that if anybody's going to cause them trouble, like real trouble, it's going to be these people. Okay. The religious leaders also know that the only reason they're still allowed to worship in the temple the way they want is because Rome is letting them, that Rome could take that away from them. So the religious people don't want to lose their religious freedom, and the Roman people don't want there to be an uprising. And so they're basically trying to, one hand washes the other, bribe each other, so that they can have this truce where Pilate can tell his Roman overseers, yeah, there's no more riots in Jerusalem, we got it under control. And the Sanhedrin can tell the people, we stood up to the Romans and you can still worship in the temple as you wish. And both sides are going to be playing on this in the rest of this conversation. So the Sanhedrin have basically a mock trial that means nothing. They bring Jesus to Pilate. When Pilate asks for the charge, they don't even have one. Pilate examines Jesus and brings it back out and says, I find this man innocent. But they want Jesus executed. And Pilate knows that it's Passover and the city is chock full of religious observant Jewish people. And if the Sanhedrin call riot, it's going to get out of hand really fast. So Pilate is trying to keep the crowds under control from Passover. And the Sanhedrin know that. The high priest knows that. So the high priest is pressuring Pilate to execute Jesus for them, even though there's no Roman charge and there's really no sound religious charge. Um, and Pilate, even though he's the one in charge, he knows that they can make his life very difficult. So it's, it's really this kind of backhanded bribery, injustice kind of thing going on, where they both sides want power, and they know that if they work together, they can help each other keep their power. Both sides are supposed to be dedicated to truth and justice, and both sides are happy to throw that out the window when it suits them. Like when Pilate washes his hands. Yeah. Matthew and Mark both talk about the different witnesses, the Thank you. false witnesses. Thank you. Now, Pilate was a Roman. Mm-hmm. Oh. Yeah, Roman governor. So there's all these power dynamics around it. And this relates back to some of the things we read in Ezekiel and even talked about in Daniel. That the lust for empire, the lust for control corrupts people. This, this want for wealth and power and dominance and control, it corrupts people's hearts. And so the same way that Nebuchadnezzar did it and Belshazzar did it and <laughs> Darius did it and Cyrus did it and Xerxes did it and you know, so on and so forth. Caesar putting his face on a coin and, you know, Caesar is Lord. He wanted everybody to say. It's the same story over and over again. It's the Tower of Babel. It's Cain killing Abel. It's I'm going to use my strength to get what I want and to not follow what God says. And it's that same story recycled over and over again. It's what's happening in Israel right now. I don't like what you said or do, so I'm going to kill. I don't like that you killed, so I'm going to kill more. Well, I don't like that you killed more, so I'm going to kill even more. And that's where it goes. That's where it goes. Um, because we meandered there, I think we're going to pause here. We'll pick up with the pilot with trial next, or the trial with pilot next week. Um, you've got the background here. If you have time, I would suggest you read through this real quick. Pay attention to what Pilate says. Pilate flat out says, this man is innocent. Okay? And they say, crucify him. And then Pilate even gives them another chance and says, I'll let, I'll let somebody go. He gives them an out. And they cry for Barabbas. So this will be your last little trivia for the night. And I'm going to exclude Pastor Karen from answering this question, even though she knows the answer. 
when the word bar is a prefix in front of a name. Does Simon. anybody know what that means? The son. The son of, right? So Simon Bar Jonah. Simon, son of John, right? Okay. When Jesus prayed, do you know the, the word he used or the title he used for God the Father? I'll let Pastor Cameron say Abba. 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 Oh, yeah. Daddy. I remember so, it. Yeah. It's, it's, it's basically dad. It's, it's a, a, it's a, relation, yeah, it's a relational daddy. term. Yeah. yeah. It's a familiar term. It's usually good. So, if you put together this other guy's name, Barabbas, hmm. what words do you see there? Son of father. Son of the father. They execute the son. And they release the guy who goes by the title, Son of the Father. Mm -hmm. Isn't that a little kick in the pants? Yeah. yeah. Barabbas, his title is Son of the Father. Mm. Mm -hmm. Interesting, huh? Aramaic is a late form of Hebrew. Yeah. It's not a totally different language. No, and you see things smushed together. A lot like how there's a lot of Hebrew in Yiddish. Yiddish is um, a mix of some Hebrew and some German. And you, you hear uh, Ashkenazi Jews use that. Um, so if you've ever watched Fiddler on the Roof, there's some Yiddish in there. Like a mix, right? Yeah. Yeah. Come here, Bubula. That means my heart. Right? <laughs> Look at that punum. That means you got a pretty face. Right? I'm not going to... I learned what some other words mean that I've used and didn't know they meant what I thought they mean, and I was actually thinking Yiddish swears. Yeah, I'm your babushka. <laughs> yeah, babushka, sure. Yeah. All right, which reminds me, my mom used to call me Bubula when I was little. I don't know if she knew she was speaking Yiddish. But... So we know a Yiddish singer and player of the piano. Yeah? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Interesting. And he does he classical Yiddish songs. Okay. So if you ever need her, <laughs> I don't know when I'll have a need for a Yiddish piano player, but if I do, I know a guy. I know a guy. All right, let's close in prayer here. <laughs> okay. Father God, thank you for your word. Thank you for this, wow, this powerful night. Father, thank you for the vulnerability here of us getting to know Jesus and what he went through and Peter and what he went through. Father, I, it probably wasn't easy for Peter to hear this story told over and over again, but we're thankful because by reading about his failings, we also get to see your forgiveness and your love mm -hmm. and how you can change lives and how being filled with your spirit changes everything. So Father, please help us to lean into that hope and that potential. And we thank you. We thank you for the chance to be forgiven and to be filled and to be yours. Father, help us to be your faithful servants. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 All right. Well, good night, everybody online. We got my mom, and we got Jane, and we got Eric. Good night, guys. And we're going to say good night to this little thingy here. Good night. Love the weather. Yeah.